Good evening. I'm James Roth, Deputy Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of Stephen Rothstein, Executive Director of the Foundation, and all my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. I also want to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. Uh, we also want to thank Boston Magazine for their support of tonight's program. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. And when Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in, the, in person to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. There's one on each side right here. In this evening's conversation, our panelists will examine the results of the 2018 midterm elections and explore what these changes will mean for Congress, the administration, and the country over the next two years and its impact beyond. So we are very pleased to have this opportunity for this timely conversation. In fact, a conversation that seems to be continuing as we haven't really finished the midterms. <laughs> I'm now delighted to introduce this evening's panelists. Mara Lyson is the national political. <laughs> the national political co correspondent for NPR. Her reports can be heard regularly regularly on NPR's award-winning news magazines, Morning Edition, and All Things Considered. Miss Lyson, sorry, <laughs> she provides extensive <laughs> coverage. I always mess up one person's name. And it happens to be you, so I'm, I apologize. Uh, extensive coverage of politics and policy from Washington, D.C., focusing on White House and Congress, and also reports on political trends beyond the Beltway. In addition, Mar is on the board of the Andrew Jackson Foundation, uh, which uh, uh, oversees the uh, uh, Hermitage, so a, a presidential connection there. Uh, Mark Preston is CNN's executive director of political programming and senior political analyst. He hosts Full Stop with Mark Preston on Sirius XM POTUS 124. Mr. Preston joined CNN in 2005 as a political editor and has received, a num and has received numerous honors, including Emmys for the network's award-winning election night coverage. <clears throat> Kate Zernike is a political reporter for the New York Times. She came to the paper from the Boston Globe in 2000 Ms. Zernike was a member of the team that shared the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for uh, explanatory reporting for a series of stories about Al-Qaeda and the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. I'm also pleased to welcome our moderator for this conversation. Nancy Cortez uh, is CBS News Chief Cor Congressional Correspondent and is based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Cortez contributes to all CBS News broadcasts and platforms, and in this role she has reported on major stories such as the rise of the Tea Party and debt ceiling and fiscal cliff negotiations in Washington. In addition, she covered the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016. So please join me. Please, please join me in welcoming all of our special guests this evening. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, thank you so much for having all of us here this evening. It is a real treat. Um, we've been uh, so immersed in this story the last week in particular, but really the last few months, that it's actually nice to have a chance to sort of digest it and think through some of the ramifications of, of this election. So thank you so much for having us. And I think we should probably kick off um, by talking about some of the races that are still outstanding, because this midterm election is <laughs> is not in the rear view mirror at this point. It is still playing out. So Mark, do you want to sort of take us through what is going on in Florida and in sure. Arizona in particular? Sure, but the caveat is what I tell you right now <laughs> could change within the next three or four minutes. And, <laughs> and I'm not lying about that. Yeah, that's you know, true. Uh, so certainly uh, that could happen. Well, Florida, of course, uh, is really the state of recounts. And that's really where we are right now. Uh, we all go back to 2000. Everybody remembers that. Um, 
Look, the problem in Florida right now is that there's, there's a lack of trust with election officials, and you have two candidates who really do not like each other, and they will do whatever they can to win. Now, you often do see that in a campaign. These two gentlemen particularly uh, do not like each other. So what we're seeing in Florida right now, by tomorrow we should have an idea about what the final vote is, where they're going to move forward, uh, whether it's going to be a, a hand count for the United States Senate race or it will be a machine count. That's based upon how many votes uh, separate Rick Scott and, uh, and Bill Nelson. So we'll know that probably by tomorrow. Uh, same thing uh, with the governor's race as well. We know that Andrew Gillum, who many of us thought was going to win Florida. I mean, I will tell you, I did a debate down there uh, with Andrew Gillum and Ron DeSantis, and I thought that Gillum would pull it out. Uh, he didn't. He, in fact, underperformed Bill Nelson, which I think really caught us uh, all off guard, but we can discuss why we think that happened. Um, but that might go to a recount as well. So Florida is not going to have uh, any, de <laughs> any decision anytime soon. Shocker. But let's head out west, and, and if you go out to Arizona, they themselves, too, are still counting votes out there. As of last night, the last time that I was, was reporting it, uh, about 140, 130, 140,000 votes had come in from Maricopa County. That's where Phoenix is. That's a big Democratic stronghold. Prior to those votes being counted, these were absentee votes and um, I think some provisional ballots, but prior to that, the Democrat Kirsten Sinema was losing she was actually behind. After those votes came in, she's on top. And now they think there's still about four to 500,000 votes that haven't been counted across the state. So <laughs> no resolution there either. So. so what, you know, it's 2018. Right. Why is it that some states are able to count their votes so much faster than others? <laughs> because, uh, honestly, if you be, uh, Look, as a nation, we have failed everybody by not putting in some kind of national election system where you can vote, whether it's by mail or whether it's by secure computer. I mean, right now, if you look at what the turnout models are or what we saw this past election, was it around 50%? Yeah, 46. Right? 46%. In a presidential year, it's around 60, 62% or, or somewhere around there. That's crazy. It's 40 you know, 40% of the country is, is not even engaging in, 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 uh, in voting, so. And this um, year broke records. And yeah. this year broke records. I mean, records. this was great. Yeah, right. this was. Mara, what conclusions should we draw from Florida before we go big oh, picture? From Florida? I mean, you know, <laughs> is, is, Florida, <laughs> is Florida going, you know, becoming a red state faster than we expect? I mean, all no. the energy was behind Andrew Gillum. No, I think, I think that Florida is still Florida which means these races are decided by one point or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a real swing state. It has, it's as d deeply divided as the country is. It has super Trumpy red areas in the panhandle and you know, some of the, east, uh, the um, west coast. And it has all of these demographically growing areas with the, with the rising American electorate mm -hmm. that favors the Democrats. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that Florida is necessarily where we get our national lessons, but <laughs> you know, just there's so many incredible factoids that came out of this election, but just one that I just saw that is great is that 15 Republican House members with an A rating from the NRA were replaced by 15 Democrats with an F rating from the NRA. I mean, so, you know, there was a lot of, because Democrats are perennial bedwetters, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth on Tuesday, boo-hoo, it wasn't a wave or it wasn't this or that. We didn't, you know, Florida was the perennial heartbreak for Democrats and they, you know, Beto didn't make it in Texas, et cetera, et cetera. The best thing I heard was, okay, the tsunami didn't show up, but the tide turned. Yeah. <laughs> so I think well, this was a definitive, significant, you know, election with lots and lots of lessons for both parties if they choose to learn them. One of the interesting things on Wednesday when everyone was sort of trying to figure out, do we call it a wave, do we not call it a wave, yeah. we realized there really is no one definition yeah. of what a wave is. So you really couldn't say, you know, definitively whether there had been a wave or not. It's sort of in the eye of the beholder. But Democrats, uh, you know, there are still some races outstanding, Kate, mm -hmm. but they are poised uh, at the end of the day to pick up somewhere between 30 and 35 seats which is a lot. I mean, Democrats told us beforehand that if they got between 20 and 30, they would, you know, they would feel really good about that. 30 to 40 was a really good night right. for them. What um, commonalities did you see between the Democrats who were able to catch the wave and the ones who weren't? I think, I think this was a victory that was led by women. And I think it's because... <laughs> um, 
You know, I think that one of the lessons of Trump was that you can come from, not out of nowhere, but that you didn't have to have the traditional experience. And so if you look at the first special election after Trump's, Trump's uh, inauguration, which was the Georgia 6 race, uh, so John Ossoff was running against Karen Handel for Tom Price's seat. And John Ossoff, there was a lot of energy behind him. He was sort of like an Andrew Gillum, Stacey Abrams type, you know, sort of a lot of Hollywood energy behind him, everyone's favorite liberal, ch liberal challenger, and he didn't win. Now you have Lucy McBath, who, again, just captures the moment so much better. She's an African-American woman. Her, her son was killed in gun violence. She's become a huge mom's demand activist, gun, anti gun violence activist. And she won in Georgia, which is really striking. That, to me, is the face, is the new face. But I also think among the women, it was a lot of these service candidates. So Mikey Sherrill, um, I think, you know, Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan, those kind of candidates who either had served in the military, Abigail Spanberger is another one, served in the CIA. That's another big trend that we're seeing. And, you know, I think these women were amazing. I mean, not only did they have service backgrounds, they all seemed to have four kids. I know. And, you know, <laughs> and flew run effortlessly. <laughs> run Ironman triathlons yes, in their right. spare time. Right, flew their yeah, kids to school in their helicopters. Exactly. Yeah, right. just, you know. <laughs> but I will tell you what was so interesting. You know, I live near Mikey Sherrill's district, and you would go to these events. And you, you know, I would see these mothers I knew from my school district, and they were out there running Mikey Sherrill's campaign. I mean, it really right. wasn't just the women running, it was mm -hmm. the women running their campaigns, whether they were campaign managers or volunteers. This was really a surge of women that we started, you know, we saw initially with the women's marches, right. and it just kept going. And I was one who thought about the women's marches, oh, you know, will this energy really sustain itself? And it did. You know, I, it's, it's interesting you say that because I remember those women's marches and being on, uh, you know, on the top of, of, of the roof and watching the parade go down the street and then watching the, the women's marches that whole weekend in Washington, D.C. was it was really supposed to be Donald Trump's weekend and it wasn't Donald right. Trump's weekend. And my thought was exactly as yours. It's great that you all came down here and that you marched and you feel good about yourself, but are you going to show up when it matters to knock on doors? And, and, and just to add to what everyone's saying here, that this will be the first Congress with more than 100 women who will be serving, which is a record. Yeah. It's a lot. Wait, and something like clear. 80 of them are Democrats. That, yeah, so, yeah. 80, so there are 84 women yeah. in Congress now. Now there right. will be 84 Democrat, yeah. Democratic mm -hmm. women alone. But let's just be clear, it's still only about 22% sure. right. yeah. of, of the House, and yeah. women are... 51% of the population, yeah. I think there are 51% of voters, so yeah. we're still not, I mean, not to be, but, to be downer, but we're still not there. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about the, how Democrats won, and, and it's interesting to go back to Ossoff, because he was the first kind of experiment, and right. it failed. And, and the experiment was, in the age of this incredible backlash against Trump, could a ham sandwich be, beat a right. Republican? The answer was no. <laughs> okay. But then they said, okay, maybe the answer to that is we need people who actually fit their district. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. That's why you had a Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania. That's why you could have an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in, in Brooklyn. Um, or wherever she was. Bronx. 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 Yeah. Bronx. Yeah. Bronx. Same thing. Same. No, not the same thing. Um, but, but anyway, so, so they did, not unlike what they did in 2006, yes. is they went out and recruited high caliber candidates who fit their district. So it wasn't a huge left wing no. wave of candidates. I think the, 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 the center of gravity among the new Democratic House members is going to be pretty moderate, pretty yeah, much in I the agree. middle, because that's where they won in Republican suburban districts. Right, and there were other candidates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who did not win. I think oh, Giant, yeah, qu you know, quite a lot Giant of them, actually. Challenge. Kara yeah. Eastman, yeah, right. quite a lot of them, yeah. actually. And, you know, the, this incredible recruiting doesn't happen by accident. It's not as if Democrats suddenly became amazing recruiters two years ago. The reality was that there were a lot of people who saw Donald Trump be victorious in 2016 and thought, you know, that's not the direction I want this country to go in, and if he can win, so can I. And they stepped up and said that they wanted to run. Mark, how much of a difference did it make that not only did you have this impressive crop of candidates, but also you had all of these progressive voters across the country who were frustrated too and looking for an outlet for their frustration and started donating money and volunteering so much earlier in a congressional cycle than you would normally see. Right. So if you go back about 30 days, 35 days, uh, we were really trying to f figure out what the frame of this election was going to be because if you go back 45 days ago, it really looked like it was going to be a blue wave, or at least that's what the media narrative was, and people were glomming onto it and they were pushing it through. So that's what everybody thought. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, one thing that I did take away from certainly two years ago and 30 days ago is that 
I realized, and it, and it really hit home, that anger was going to be a much more potent fuel to get people to the polls. Republicans had just won. They had just gotten Kavanaugh elected. They won. They weren't going to be angry. They didn't have pitchforks in their hands to go out in, in, in necessarily, certainly in these House races. In the Senate, they did. And they were playing in states that were very difficult. And I, I know we'll talk about that and the recruiting mm -hmm. over there. But I do think that you saw this energy from the progressive side uh, of the party come alive. Now, the question is, we're going to have 20, 25 Democrats that are going to run. Are they all going to, is there going to be fratricide? Are we going to see them kill each other? And could we see Donald Trump win another term? Again, that, we could talk for hours on that. Right. I mean, what, what lessons is the party taking from uh, the victories, at least in the House, on Tuesday? Are they going to decide that, you know, that, that the party needs to go in a more progressive direction, more centrist direction? What do you think the lessons are that they're drawing? Well, I think, you know, one big fundamental question for Democrats is do they want to be the left-wing mirror image of Donald Trump and mm -hmm. Trumpism or not? And I think there are a lot of lessons from the uh, results from Tuesday. I don't know if any Democrats will learn them, but the way it was described to me is you have to have a candidate that can eat off the other guy's plate. Right. In other words, it's not just enough to win in a blue district. You, you know, and, and maybe if Gillum or Abrams or fall short, or Beto certainly did, maybe they couldn't eat enough off the other guy's plate. Sherrod Brown figured out how to eat off the other guy's plate. In other words, you have to be able to, yes, you can, you can take advantage of the demographics which favor Democrats, you know, that the electorate is getting younger and browner and more female, et cetera, but you have to be able to get white, working class rural votes to a certain extent, or at least not get killed in those counties. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a big lesson for Democrats. Um, I think that in terms of 2020, Tuesday night was a good night for the Amy Klobuchars, the Joe Bidens, you know, the Hickenloopers of the world, and not a great night for the Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker's, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Bernie Sanders. Because you think it's people who can cross over, have I some think, crossover? Yes, appeal, they have to have some crossover. We are a super divided country. That's what we had two elections. One was a national election and the Democrats won that. It was a clear repudiation of Trump. The other was an election in these red states mm -hmm. where the Trump coalition is as vigorous and robust as ever. They really turn out. And, you know, Democrats can't win without any of those votes. Mm -hmm. can, can, can I just add to that? Yeah. And, and what I think that, that Mara's saying, please tell me, you yeah. know, if I'm, if I'm wrong here, is that when you're talking about a candidate and we're not going to talk about 2020 because that could be for next week or yeah. for the, every week until yeah, 2020. Yeah, really, or tomorrow, yeah. yeah. But you look at somebody like a mayor f from New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, who at first I thought, you know, like he's not necessarily somebody who could do it. But gosh, if you hear that guy talk, yeah. he can talk progressive and he can talk middle of the road and, yeah. and he can connect with a lot yeah. of people. He yeah, really yeah, can. You have to have a wide range. And, and right. I, don't, I can see a ticket that has, you know, someone, a minority or right. a woman mm -hmm. on it, but, but you can't. I mean, the, the, more, the lesson from this election was, no, you can't just run to the left, run on raising the minimum wage and getting rid of ICE and impeaching the president and think that's the way that you're going to defeat him. But I think it was, I think they know that immigration is not their issue, so they didn't talk about ICE a lot. That was, you know, that, yeah. that was something yeah. they stayed away from. They were smart. But they yeah. were on message on health care, and I think that Absolutely. is really, yes. you know, what you can deliver yeah. for people is really important. But yeah. I also think we need to remember the governor's races. I mean, as much as they didn't change yeah. these rural areas, we don't know what's going to happen in these rural areas. In Michigan and in Wisconsin, we now have Democratic governors. That's huge two yeah. years after those, those, And that means that those are back in the battleground. Yes. He yep. didn't put them, Trump did not put them out of reach. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. right. Ohio might be turning red, Iowa might be turning red, but those Midwestern states are back in play and the Sun Belt. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. talk about health care because Democrats you know, traditionally are not known for message discipline. Right. But when it came to health care and Obamacare, they were, they were like you know, robotic. They right. were focused yeah. on that as their key issue. They did not get distracted by the Trump story du jour mm -hmm. for the most part. And how fascinating that the very issue that probably uh, caused them to lose their House majority in 2010, yep. Obamacare, is now the number one issue in this campaign and ushered them back in. You know, even a couple of years ago when I was covering midterm elections, Democrats didn't even want to utter the word Obamacare because it was so radioactive. And suddenly it is the centerpiece of their campaigns. And obviously a big part of that is the fact that it's just now been around for a while. The popularity of the law is up. Everybody knows someone 
who has a pre-existing condition, who is relying upon it. But talk about the, Mark, I'll start with you. Talk a little bit about this huge shift and where the issue goes from here. So if you look where we are right now, if you go back to 2000, 10, right, when, when we really started fighting about this and, and we saw Democrats lo lose the House of Representatives, nobody knew if the, how it was going to work, how it was going to be implemented, how many people it, it was going to affect. But what happened is once it got implemented, you can't take it away. You cannot do that. That's why you hear Republicans say time and time again, you know, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts, and if you rescind a tax cut, they call it a, 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 an increase. That's what Republicans uh, feel to understand, and they tried to get it through in the House of Representatives, and if they can't get it through the United States Senate in that very dramatic vote where John McCain comes back from Arizona, puts his <laughs> thumb down. I mean, good, Donald Trump talks about it every other day, so yeah. it, it's, it's very <laughs> mindful. But what, but what is, is interesting is, is you're right, they didn't run away from it. They talked about it in their districts, and they spent their money in the last 30 days. That was the number one issue in, in Democratic uh, television ads was health care. That's what they were telegraphing back home, and it worked. Well, talk and about Dave Bratt, because that was, yeah. that, he well, did a really good work on that. I mean, it is yeah. pre-existing conditions, but it's not just that. Remember that Obamacare, what it did was expand Medicaid. And Medicaid's always been this you know, sort of poor stepchild of, of mm -hmm. Medicare, Medicaid. Everyone loves, you know, protect Medicare, but we don't really care about Medicaid. That's poor people. Now Medicaid is middle class people. Right. It's, it's a lot more of a population. And if you look at the poll numbers, I mean, the number over the last five years of people who know someone who is on Medicaid, right. suddenly it's like in the, it's in the mid-60s. Right. That's and it's sure. not even just that. It's the fact that a lot of rural hospitals, right. uh, rural health centers are funded partially by Medicaid. So if you live in a state where they didn't expand Medicaid and your local hospital closes, I mean, that is a very, that's something you can feel in a lot of communities, rural hospitals and insurance companies are the biggest employers. Right. That's in why area. Utah, Idaho, and Nebraska just passed referendums right. expanding Medicaid. Right. Red, uh, those are some pretty red states. Right. Mm -hmm. But Mara brought up the, the Dave Bratt race, yes. the Dave Bratt Ab Abigail Spanberger race, which is Virginia 7. And this is, um, it's sort of Richmond and a little bit north, Henrico and Chesterfield counties. And this was the place where um, Eric Cantor was a representative, and he was totally upset, complete sort of like dark of night. We all woke up in the morning and went, who lost? Eric Cantor lost. Yeah. The majority so, yeah. leader of the, the House of Representatives in a primary. You know, that's, never never done himself. that's never happened before. Right. Yeah. Um, he lost to this economics professor, Dave Bratt, and it was a challenge from the right. And Dave Bratt was saying, Dave Bratt was, was arguing about health care and immigration and saying, why does it, you know, if Eric Cantor really wants to repeal this, he shouldn't be passing these budgets that all have a funding for Obamacare. And so lo and behold, four years, that's four years ago, now four years later, comes a woman, Abigail Spanberger, again, one of these service candidates, she's a CIA operative, comes along, runs from the left on health care. That's what caused her to get into the race. Yes, yeah, she, she, she said she got into the race the day that the House Republicans decided to vote on the bill without waiting to get a CBO score. And of course, the CBO score is what tells you how many people are going to lose health care, how much money we might save from this. And she thought, this is insane. I mean, they're not even waiting to get the score. She call, says, you know, in her story, she calls her husband and says, that's it, I'm running for office. Mm -hmm. That's a bit, because they didn't get the CBO score. To me, that tells you why is why yes. this election was a League of Women Voters election, not an SDS burn it down yes. election. Yes. This <laughs> was about women saying you didn't get the CBO score. Right. This this was such a little D right. Democratic moment, yeah. mm -hmm. I think, because it was about voting and turning out for town meetings and women who were so responsible that they were offended that they didn't get a CBO score. It wasn't about people, you know, saying, you know, anarchists rushing into the street saying, burn the system down. That's not what this was about. And even Dave Bratt admitted famously that the women are all up in my grill yes. right. about health care. Quote of the midterms. <laughs> and the women are up in, in my grill, grill everywhere That's I go. That's a direct quote. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the Abigail Spanberger race because, you know, her district is so is, is such a red district that actually Democrats <laughs> thought that they'd be able to pick off a couple of other seats in Virginia Not before she would be successful. She was one of the candidates that they thought was their biggest stars of the cycle, but they said, but you know, it's just such a red, right. red district will be, you know, it'll, if, if we win that seat, it's an unbelievable night. And that's what I thought was so fascinating is there were a couple of seats and hers was one that didn't really fit the pattern. There were some districts nobody was even looking at. Mm. Oklahoma, for example. Or Elaine Luria in Virginia. Exactly. Or how about, how about Mark Sanford's seat right. in right. South Carolina, so, who was defeated by a Trumpist, Katie Arrington, and then she got defeated by a Democrat. That's unbelievable. So what happened? What happened, Mark? 
Thank you. It, it goes back to, to candidate recruitment and their ability to energize uh, folks in their area to get behind their campaign. Now, everybody here is from Massachusetts. I mean, this is, I grew up here. We know that politics kind of pulsates through people's blood. I mean, look, everybody's here. It's Friday night. I don't know how you made it here <laughs> through the traffic, traffic, but you did. Uh, but, 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 but because you do live here, you don't necessarily get to see the, this, this, this grassroots grounds up, th this, this come from behind uh, kind of campaign. And we saw that all across the country. And look, there are still 10 races out in the House of Representatives right now. There are three in California, one of them in Orange County. Orange County might as well have been called Red County before Hillary Clinton yeah. won it in 2016. But she didn't kill it in 2016. Um, and now there are three uh, California representatives that are all tucked in close to each other, including Dana Rohrabacher, who's kind of close to uh, uh, Putin, who could go because of this. <laughs> so, I mean, that certainly says something. And, you know, just, to, just to, since we are in Massachusetts, just a shout out to Massachusetts. I mean, one thing that we'll get to probably is now what do voters expect? We have right. divided mm -hmm. government Let's again. Talk about that. I mean, Charlie Baker, along with Larry Hogan and I guess Bill Scott in Vermont, mm -hmm three the most popular politicians by approval ratings in America today, Republican governors of blue states. What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. I mean, people like a check and balance, but they want both parties to do something. Right. right. Yeah, and get so something done. So what are yeah. they going to do? What, what does that, you know, so you're Nancy Pelosi. Should we Pelosi. just walk off right let's, now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so say you're Nancy Pelosi, and let's, you know, by the way, let's talk about her future in a moment. But... Um, if you're Nancy Pelosi and you're looking at, you know, Donald Trump is in the White House, Mitch McConnell on the other side of the Capitol, what do you do? What issues do you talk about? Where do you try to get something done? So you try to get something done with him on infrastructure because he said he wants to do that. Yep. Um, you stay away from impeachment. You talk about protecting yep. the investigation, protecting the integrity of the investigations. That's your language. Mm -hmm. um, you don't talk about abolishing ICE. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she did this drug prices. Drug prices. That's her mm -hmm. other her other area of commonality with, mm -hmm. with Donald Trump. And you know, she did this with in two thousand six when the issue was the issue that sort of changed over the summer. The way I think healthcare did this time, which was the Iraq War. And in two thousand six, it was still kind of dangerous for Democrats to come out and say we don't support the war. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of you know. But then there were the lefties saying like, well, we need to impeach Bush. And yeah. so I remember someone saying to me, a radio host saying to me the morning after. Well, so Nancy Pelosi is going to impeach Bush now, right? And I was like, you're out of your mind. Like, yeah. she knows better than to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is true in this case. So we've seen her do that before. And I think she's got to kind of steer a fairly moderate yeah, path. I mean, she said, first of all, there's going to be oversight. There's not going to be in a rush to impeachment. Why did she say we're not going to have a lot of freelancing? Fr freelancing, freelancing <laughs> yeah. But, no, that's really important. Look, Democrats did not like lock her up. They do not want to do the left-wing version of that, mm -hmm. which could be just calling for impeachment before you've even you know, done an investigation. But I think there will be oversight. I think there will be efforts on those issues, infrastructure, drug pricing. Um, Donald Trump needs something to show for his next two years in office. And Democrats, I think Democrats will pass a lot of stuff in the House, even if it goes nowhere in the Senate, because they want to lay down markers for 2020. They want to pass a lot of stuff that's popular with the country. I'm sure they'll do something on pre-existing conditions, right. you know, on the minimum wage, on ethics reform. There, there's a lot of things that they can pass in the House to show what they're for, even yeah. if it doesn't ever get signed into law. But the president has sat down with Chuck and Nancy, as he calls them, before, <laughs> and you know, and actually seemed to kind of enjoy it for five and minutes. said that we, we worked yeah. something out, and then he yeah, yeah. has gotten pulled back by his own party. You know, this is the same person who uh, replaced Jeff Sessions with Matt Whitaker yeah, yeah, yeah. and then comes out this morning and says, I, I don't even know, I don't know this guy. guy. Although so, a week before he said that he, no, he <laughs> thought he was a great guy. He was a great right. guy. Yeah. You right. know, it, so, so here's the problem. Sorry to be joking about that, but if we don't joke about it, we'll never get through <laughs> yeah. it, right? You know, he, he, here's, here's the situation, I, I think, in, in Congress right now. Uh, Mara's absolutely right and Kate's absolutely right. The House is going to try to get some things done. They have to lay markers on. They have to show that they can govern. It's going to go nowhere in the Senate. We saw Mitch McConnell has already come out and said that his goal for the next two years yep. is to just focus judges, on judges. Judges, 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 yeah. judges. So even though, and we'll talk, or if we'll talk about this, about the changing demographics and how the Democratic Party actually seems to have a, a better future, the judiciary is going to be rock solid conservative mm -hmm. for, gosh, the next 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, that is all the way up and down from district and what, court 
all the way up to the Supreme Court. And that's Court. a thought experiment. What happens when the, the Supreme Court and the judiciary is so at odds with, pub, with popular Congress, opinion? We've right. had this before in American history, but that, those are two tectonic plates that are like ready for an earthquake. Yeah. Mara, does Nancy Pelosi have to worry about getting the votes to be speaker? Well, I, th I don't think, yeah, she has to work for it. I, I, don't, I think she's going to be the speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, so they, they, yeah, but they she, and she's also said that she'll be a transitional figure at some point. She's not going to be the speaker in 2020. I think we're pretty clear yes. on that, which is good. You know, she knows right. that she's, she's the one to lead them now, mm -hmm. and I think that she'll have the votes to do that, but then she's got to groom a new generation and she, you know. But it is sort of fascinating that here's this person who just, you know, helped to usher in a 30, 35, uh, seat shift raised more than a hundred million dollars, and yet she's fending off a pretty serious challenge to her leadership. But from who? Yeah, yeah. See, I think actually that that's a little yeah, overstated. From who? I think you know what they they count twenty four mm -hmm. candidates who have said I'm not going to, including Abigail Spanberger, just mm -hmm. since we talked about her. But what a lot of these candidates have said, like Donna Shalala, has not said she'll vote right. for Nancy Pelosi. So, but she's out campaigning with her. So right. I think a lot of a lot of the candidates who are saying that are saying. I'm not going to say who I'm voting for because it would be premature. This is mm -hmm. before the election. It would be premature for me to assume that I win this election and then, then I know who's running. Right. So I, I think they don't actually, I don't, we don't know who's running, as Mara said. And also, I just think, I'm not sure the votes are there to topple her. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, within the last week, as Democrats got more confident about winning, they were all on the phone to Nancy Pelosi working like, what's my chair? You know, can yeah. I get on this committee? Can I get on that committee? Like, <laughs> things change when you have the gavel. So right. I, I think it's, it, I'm not sure we've seen the end of her. No, but Nancy, I, I, I think you're right, though, to note that she, she has won all these seats and she comes in slightly injured. I mean, she's not injured, but she's just like slightly injured. She's not coming in triumphant, like, you, you know, we're going to take it over and, the and roll the Republican like in 2006. Yeah, right. yeah that, that did not happen. I mean, yeah. and, 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 you know, she's obviously being very smart and, and very calculated about making sure she keeps um, the Democratic caucus together. You know, Nancy Pelosi, we just did a poll last week, shocker, that said uh, that Nancy Pelosi was actually had a lower approval rating than Donald Trump. Well, but there are other polls that say the opposite. Uh, true, uh, but, but, but I would say this uh, about but that But she's poll. not running against him for president. No, 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 she's not. But what I would say about that is, is two things. I, I do think that, that there is sexism built into how people yeah. respond to, yeah. to, to that. And I also do think that, that people don't like the caricature of yeah. her being this ultra-liberal that's going to steal all your money. Yeah. And right. Republicans have done a very good job of at least painting yeah. it that way, right. even though she's not necessarily that way. Right. But the poll that I was interested in, and this is a CNN poll, was, was the, they asked people the most important issues to them. And so Nancy Pelosi, I, I forget the exact number, but I think it was like immigration, health care, um, campaign finance, campaign finance gun violence. Gun Those violence. were all much, much higher than Nancy, the idea right. that Nancy Pelosi will be your speaker. The, the Nancy right. Pelosi messages weren't working as well this time as right. they did maybe even four years ago. And that's why, you know, uh, even a couple of years ago, Republican ads were Nancy Pelosi. You know, this time around, it was, they're going to take your guns and they're going to let all the immigrants in. And Nancy Pelosi and a couple other things. Right. You know, she wasn't front and center yeah. because I think that message has lost some potency. Yeah, but just like it's unclear to us who would replace her, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the Democrats' 2020 field. It's just unclear who is yeah. the next standard bearer. You know, we know that there has to be a generational shift for Democrats, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, their leadership is all in their upper 70s, mm -hmm. and this is a party that has tremendous support among young voters. I mean, that disconnect has to be, that circle has to be right. squared at some point. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Senate, because I think mm -hmm. Democrats were, uh, you know, conversely actually caught by surprise a little bit by the fact that they lost not just the Heidi Heitkamp Senate seat and the Claire McCaskill Senate seat, which they thought they might be able to mm -hmm. hold on to, but Joe Donnelly, that kind of came yeah. out I of disagree. nowhere. Well, no, no, well, I mean, see, yeah. we, yeah. the yeah. narrative was Joe Donnelly was going to win. Yeah. I never thought he yeah. was going to win. It was um, Indiana. I, I, yeah. Mike Pence is from Indiana. It's very conservative. I never understood oh, that narrative. How did... How did John Tester hang on and the others didn't? Because John, John Tester and Joe right. Manchin John Tester are is, their is own Montana. brands in their, in their states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the other thing is that w at the beginning of the cycle, I asked every Democratic senator, what's your definition of success? Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, 
if we just lost one or two, that would be, that's beyond our wildest dreams. Right. Like, that would be that's incredible. True. Right. And then there was this, so, so the Republicans started the cycle thinking they could get five. Right. Then we went through this period of democratic fantasy. Yeah. Where, right. Tennessee, Texas, right. you're yeah. going to hold all our incumbents, you know? And, 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 but that dissipated. Right. I think that, we, first of all, the dust hasn't settled because we don't know about right. Florida Arizona. And, and Arizona. If they are down net two, that's yeah. a great night for Democrats. Mm. Right. If I think if, if the Republicans win net three or more, that's success for them. Right. For Republicans. Yeah, no, yeah. no I mean, uh, the fact that Mitch McConnell was able to add at least one or yeah. two people to try to mitigate the Susan Collinses and the Lisa Murkowskis when it comes to very important votes, that's a huge yeah. victory. Yeah, makes right. his life Especially a lot easier. Judges. Right. Yep. I and mean, let's, this is a smart crowd, so you all yeah. probably know this already, but you know, Democrats described this year's map in the Senate as the worst map they've ever seen. It Basically, was, since 1914. They it was a really terrible map. It's just, you know, sort of luck of the draw. They, they were defending 26 seats. Republicans were defending nine. Uh, and 10 Democrats were up for election or re-election in states that Donald Trump had won in uh, by in, sometimes in over 20, 20 points in 2016 yeah. they were defending 10 seats so it is remarkable I think a couple of years ago when they started out this cycle they thought that they were gonna have to work harder to, to defend Sherrod Brown's yeah, seat right. in Ohio or Tammy or Baldwin, Tammy Baldwin. Or, Tammy Baldwin yeah. or even Bob Casey in, yeah. in Pennsylvania and those candidates were sort of able to, to, to lock it away pretty quickly um, and yet you're kind of you know you saw almost the entire center uh, yeah, the centrists right. in the Democratic Party evaporate overnight. I mean, you have, you know, these deal makers in the Senate who need, out of political survival, to work across the aisle. They're gone. Same thing happened on the Republican side. You don't have Bob Corker anymore, or John right. McCain, mm -hmm. or Jeff Flake. Jeff Flake. I mean, right. that has been the story. That's the other big takeaway, and that's the kind of depressing takeaway. We're much more divided. Mm -hmm. The center is even more decimated than it was before, and it was already pretty lonely. Um, yeah. When when you don't have overlap between the two parties like we had for so long, it's really hard to make bipartisan deals. And it's hard to get big pieces of legislation passed with bipartisan buy-in so that they're sustainable, mm -hmm. unlike Obamacare, mm -hmm. which you know mm -hmm. was passed with 51 votes, just like the tax cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I think, that d division and the fact that we have a president who uses division and divisiveness as his kind of modus operandi, that's going to be with us for a very long time. But that was interesting. On the on election day, I was talking to voters and just saying, you know, what's, as we always ask, what's the biggest issue that got you out today? And so many people said, unity or the country's not working and it wasn't clear to me the people who said unity because most of them didn't want to tell me how they were voting whether that meant they were voting for democrats because they thought the democrats would find common ground or because we needed to have a little more balance or whether they thought like yes all in on trump i my sense was that this was more they were voting for democrats but mm -hmm. Well, I was talking to Sherry Bustos, who's a, a congresswoman from uh, Illinois and a real up-and-comer and, -comer and um, you know, actually campaigned for a lot of other candidates this time around because she had a kind of wacky opponent and so she knew she didn't have to spend that much time on her own, own race. Um, and she said that the number one thing that she hears from... Oh. Do we have a doctor? Or a nurse? Looks like we have one. It looks like we have a bunch of doctors. <laughs> which Boston. is, it's Boston. I think we should, oh, he's out there. Steve is saying keep going. Yeah, keep What's going. What's up? Keep going? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Sounds like we're going to be, okay. So um, what were we talking about? 
Well, can I bring up one issue? Oh, Sherry Bustos from, Sherry one, of those, oh, right, from right, one of those. From one of those, eat off the other guy's plate okay. uh, so, districts. Right. So, White, rural, so yeah. Sherry Bustos, she was saying that um, even when she talks to a lot of the uh, Republican voters, farmers from her district, you know, even the ones who are concerned about some of the president's trade moves, they're, the overwhelming thing that she heard from them was not, um, you know, you got, I, I want you to win so you can get in there and, and fight back. The number one thing she heard was, we want you to work together. We yeah. want, you know, we want to get people in who will work with the other side. So is, there is still this overwhelming desire for the two sides to work together. And how are they going to play that? Because you've got Democrats, Nancy Pelosi in her press conference saying, we're willing to work with him on these things, but of course we're not going to give up our con constitutional responsibility to do oversight. The president says, well, I'm willing to work with them, but not if they investigate me. If they right. investigate, we can't do both at the same time, he says. If they do that, we're in right. a warlike posture. Not know? only did he say that, he said, if the House, the House Democrats yeah. investigate me, I'm going to get you, the Senate, Senate to investigate them. He yeah. doesn't oversee the Senate. Yeah. And yeah. He says, you know, I learned yeah. it in third grade, maybe fourth grade, the whole three yeah, 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 co-equal yeah. branches yeah. of government. Yeah, tax cut in the last week, remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The oh, my God, the 10 percent. But this is, this, is, this is, look, this is a work in progress. What you saw the other day was Donald Trump trying to absorb what just happened right. to right. him. And, he, and I don't know if he has finished, pro he certainly hasn't finished processing it. He might never. Um, we don't know. <laughs> But, yeah. um, but, but that's going to be so interesting going forward. Most presidents who've had an opposition Congress have been investigated. And they've also worked on legislation. He said flatly, you can't do both at the same time. The one thing I do. The Republicans had no trouble doing both at the same yeah, absolutely time. Right? Not. Absolutely uh, not. When President Obama absolutely was, not. was in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I do think we should talk about is, is how the Democrats are going to respond to the question of, of gun violence, right? So we wake up Wednesday morning, and the yeah. House Democrats, uh, the Democrats have taken the House. Uh, another Thursday mass morning, shooting. Thursday yeah. morning, right. we wake up to another mass shooting. Right. And so I really do wonder, you know, is this going to be like health care was in 2010, where, or sorry, in 2008, when mm -hmm. Barack Obama wins, and the Democrats think they have a mandate to do something big, and this was the big thing they choose. I really wonder, and I, I don't... They don't have the White House. Yeah. I think that... I don't, I don't think they see have a that. Mandate, they don't have a mandate for that. I think the challenge is that there are, you know, a lot of Democrats feel very strongly about gun violence. A lot of their voters feel very strongly about gun violence, but it is never the number one issue right. for their voters. I think you'll and see more action in the states on that. Yeah. And where Democrats so, have made gains. you know, yeah. the Democrats at this point are, are, you know, they're sort of cowed. Even the ones who had all a few years ago. They don't talk about it that much because it's like banging their head up against right. a wall. You know what's interesting about guns, though, and in, in, in you bring it up, is that what will Michael Bloomberg do? We know how much mm. money he has yeah. already put into mm -hmm. guns. We already know how much money he's put into House Democrats. We already know how much money he has that he wants to put in so that he can <laughs> run for president himself. And he is from Medford, so y'all could vote for him if you wanted to, right? <laughs> he is from Boston, right, or, or from the Boston area. But somebody told me this the other day, which I had not known, is that is that every town, which is the Bloomberg yeah. organization, and all these other anti-NRA um, type groups are actually coming together, and, and they've actually become a lot stronger. And at some point, they think in the next maybe like five years that they can match the NRA when it comes to money and lobbying and, and really changing it. I, I don't know if it will. So well, Moms wow. in Action. Moms in Action has yeah. five million members. Yeah. That's, wow. that's pretty huge. They are now mm -hmm. merging. They've merged yeah. with every town. So mm -hmm. that's. Yeah. And you saw these red-shirted mothers, again, yeah. as part of this, this wave of women behind the, the female candidates. Mm -hmm. They were fighting on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn it uh, uh, to the audience because I'm sure a lot of you have, have questions. So we have microphones here on either side. And if you have a question, please feel free to, to come up. Sir, I'll start with you. Yeah, well, uh, this year's election was much less of a repudiation of the president than the 2010 uh, election was. In Obama's first midterm, Democrats lost 63 seats, which is more than twice as many as Republicans. They also lost six Senate seats uh, where the Republicans had a, a net gain. Now, I know you people are from the media, so you're obviously biased against the president. Uh, and you've discussed this whole election from a strictly Democratic point of view, but you have to, and despite the fact that the Democrats outspent the Republicans, you have to give the president uh, a lot of credit for stanching the losses of the Republicans, don't you? His barnstorming tour in the last uh, month of the campaign really helped to seal a lot of Senate uh, victories. So despite the fact that you're all Democrats, uh, this wasn't really as bad a uh, loss or so-called repudiation as Obama's first midterm, was it? 
Well, I, I take issue with your characterization of our political views, but I do take your point about the large numbers in 2010. Um, it's true that there was a huge 63-seat swing in 2010. This one was half that size. Is it apples to apples? No, it, I mean, it's not apples to apples. And, and, and look, that was devastating for the Democratic Party in 2010. Let nobody tell you anything else. 63 seats is an enormous amount. That is beyond a red wave, yeah. okay? That was just yeah. uh, a total annihilation, Blood okay? Bath. But what we've seen, what, what we've seen, though, is that um, certainly when Donald Trump was able to win states such as Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, he wasn't able to hold those states. So the attraction for Donald Trump, it doesn't matter. A win is a win. And you got to understand, when people talk about what's a blue wave and what's not a blue wave, you know what a blue wave is? A blue wave is 218 votes because then you can subpoena taxes, you can, you can inve investigate an administration. There's a lot you can do. Now, I, I'm not saying that the Democratic Party is, is going to go into this next two years and, and do wonderful things because I think they're probably going to kill themselves and they will absolutely screw it up. But that's because our government, our government as a whole is incredibly, incredibly screwed up right now. And, and honestly, it's because, and I, I do say this oftentimes and people don't like me saying this, but it's because of you all, right? It's because of voters who decide to send certain people back to Congress, such, Steve, such as the likes of Steve King. You saw, you saw two people who are, who are who are now being investigated by the Justice Department, indicted. who win, indicted, who win seats, who win re-election, that in itself is a problem. But, but, but I want to—I agree with you. The president should be given his due. In the Senate, he kept those seats. He helped defeat Democrats, and I think he's right to claim the credit for that. I also think that there's nothing about this election that tells us that Donald Trump is not going to be able to win re-election. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. That's not what this election tells us. Tells us. But it does tell us that voters chose to have a check and balance on the president. Right. I mean, that is the bottom line. Yeah. Sir? Hi, I'm Bruce Carey from Mission Hill. Uh, <laughs> speaking of divided electorates, I wonder if you saw an effect of the Citizens United uh, factor in this election, in this midterm election, or was it merely that big blue money countered big red money? I think it was the early blue money that made a big difference. You know, it's not just raising outraising your opponent it's also when you raise it because if you can you know if you can raise a lot of money early on that means you can build a staff early on it means you can uh, go on on television and and online with ads early on that define you yourself and define your opponent and what we saw in this election correct me if i'm wrong but is, is that there was all this sort of free floating democratic energy after 2016 they all thought that we were going to see the first woman president, and you know, from one day to the next, that turned out not to be the case. They ended up putting money where they could, and that gave a lot of these candidates, you know, challengers who normally never outraise their right. incumbent opponents, gave them a chance to sort of get out there early and define themselves, and gave them a pretty significant so leg up. Hmm? So thank you, Justice Roberts. <laughs> well, no, no because no, that no, wasn't I mean, citizens. You know, that wasn't. The Democrats raised money. They had their billionaires too, but they never will be able to match the big unlimited donations. The Republicans still have the Citizens United advantage, but what Democrats were able to do this year was raise tremendous amounts of money, some from people like Tom Steyer and Mike Bloomberg, right. but a lot from small donations. And uh, this was the first time where I think something like 55 House Republican incumbents were outspent by their challengers, like in some cases two to one, which has never happened before. And also, Democratic women in the House, challengers in the House, or maybe it was, I guess, Democratic women in the House, they raised the most money of anybody of all from small donations. So I think that's really huge. We also saw a 36% increase in donations from women to Democrat, no, I'm sorry, to candidates overall, but the biggest beneficiaries, again, were Democratic women. Women started donating to, if you look at the chart of the way women's donations went, women, uh, female House candidates, Republican men, like, the, 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 it just drops off the cliff. I mean, it was incredible, the line. They just were not going to support Republican men. We're supporting Democratic women. That's huge. And that's a long-lasting change, I think, the split, in the, the gender divide and party identification. So stay in the fight, everybody. Hi, my name's Paul Yorkus. I'm from Medway, Massachusetts. And first of all, I want to say that I do not believe any of you are my enemy. <laughs> any of us are what? Not his enemies. Hmm? We're not what? his enemies. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Um, I, 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 I do have a concern that I want to share with you that I would love to hear each of you react to. I remember Strom Thurmond and I remember George Wallace. And now we have a person in the White House who attacks minorities, religious minorities, persons of color. And I think that that is setting an evil tone in our country. But I would like to hear from you what your thoughts are about that. Let me see. I'm going to CNN, put on, okay, I'm gonna right. <laughs> he doesn't necessarily like, the president I'm, doesn't like CNN, okay, right. we've been in the news with this. Okay. You, know what I, you know what I do say on, I, I try to say this often on uh, whenever I'm on TV, is that my criticism of the president never has to do with what his legislation is. I, I, I don't care. I mean, I, he was elected. He's going to try to get it through. If he can get it through, I might not agree with everything personally, but look, he's there to do that. To your point, though, the moral, the moral question about how he acts, and I have my 13-year-old son w with me here tonight, and I can't look at him or, or at his uh, sister, who's 14 years old, and say, he's someone you, you should look up to. And it's very hard to do that. And as a father, that is very difficult. It has nothing to do with politics. And by the way, if you talk to any Republican you know, who's worth their salt, they will tell you the same thing. Yeah, but you know what? It has something to do with politics because Donald Trump has chosen racial animosity as a strategy and a tactic and it worked for him in 2016 and he thinks it worked for him again because he spent what was his closing argument it was about the caravan it was about all of these criminal illegal aliens invading us coming across the border to kill us basically <laughs> and that's what he thinks works for him um, even though you know in a few stray moments in interviews he did said gee maybe I should soften my tone but this is what's worked for him. And the big question is going forward, you know, does he double down on that or does he, does he decide he should dial it back? Mark, it feels like we have crossed a new line with the White House releasing a doctored video to try to claim yeah. that one of your correspondents, yeah. Jim Acosta, laid hands on a female intern, how, I hate to put you on the spot, but I don't really hate it. So tell me how, 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 how's uh, CNN thinking about this, responding, you know, what's next? You, you, know, you know, a couple things. One is uh, we all watched that live. I mean, we all watched it live. Yeah. And then they decided to put out a doctored video. It's just, it's amazing the ability to lie and steer at you straight in the face and tell you to believe it. I mean, it really does go to the whole idea of gaslighting, which we haven't talked about a whole lot on, on cable news in the last week or so, but that really is what Donald Trump does. He gaslights you. He, he convinces you that he's right, even though when he's wrong. As far as what's happening with us, you know, he not only went after Jim Acosta and pulled his hard pass, which has never happened, basically said that freedom of the press is not free anymore in the United States, right? And that's, that's what he did when he pulled that. But he also uh, called one of my colleagues this morning, Excuse me? Sir, he ended up doing a news conference for like 90 minutes and took multiple questions from people who had already asked questions before. So there was plenty of time to ask questions. And, and, and look, I understand that everybody <coughs> wants to get a question in. But he said to my colleague this morning, a, a woman by the name Abby of Abby Phillip, Phillip who, is, uh, who is a really a smart, up and coming, really good White House correspondent, and, uh, and calls her stupid today because he asked her a question. She didn't like, she also happened to she be African-American. She mm. said, do you want Mark Whitaker right. to clamp Re down on the Mueller investigation? Right. Pretty legitimate, basic Recuse question. Recuse himself, basically. Recu yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and he said, that's a stupid question. I watch you on TV all the time, which he doesn't watch CNN, but apparently he does. And, mm. that you, and you ask stupid questions is what he said. Now, the day before, he told April Ryan, who's one of our commentators as well, that she's stupid as well. So, like, I understand people who like Donald Trump say, uh, look, the media is all against him. Well, not necessarily all against him. It's just he's got to act presidential. It's not asking that well, much. But, you know, th there's a lot about the era that we're in right now in politics it's, that is a stress test on democratic institutions, on Congress, on the judiciary, and certainly on the press. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't need a hard pass to cover the White House. 100%. I agree. Jim Acosta, and, we, you know, Mark talked about this before, can set up his tripod in Lafayette Park and continue reporting 
on, on there the are actually president. rules where, where you can go to Lafayette Park and go live and techno technologically you can do this yeah. and be live outside the White House, which yeah. would drive Donald Trump absolutely. But, <laughs> but you know, but but one of the things about you know it's so interesting to, to talk about when the president or his um, aides lie. What is the purpose when it's there? It's so easily refuted, or there's videotape that shows the opposite. Right. Some of it might be gaslighting. Some of it is just sheer dominance to see what you can get away with. Right. You know, or to change the subject. Or to change, change the, the subject. subject from losing the house right. to a fight with. Or the change media. the subject from Sessions to Acosta. Right. Mm. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Sir. Uh, Kevin you. Thorpe from Melrose. I, I have some concerns about the uh, Congress in the next two months, the lame duck Congress. Uh, what might they try to pull or pass uh, in the next two months? Are they going to try to finance the wall? Are they going to try to pass oh, the, the tax duck. bill that's been passed by the House? Uh, I, you know, is Mitch got something up his sleeve that he wants to get through? Nancy, you're probably best. Uh, what do you think? Well, you think? so the wall is a really interesting, uh, is an interesting issue because yes, they have been pushing the president off uh, funding bill to funding bill. We'll get it next time. We'll get it next time because there are a lot, certainly the Republican leadership, but also a lot of the Republican rank and file does not actually share the president's passion for building a wall and the same desire to spend $25 billion as a down payment to do it. And yet, you know, it is obviously his central animating issue. It's something that he promised as president. He's been waiting every time they tell him next time. And now there's not going to be any more next times because they won't be able to push it through once Democrats take control of the House. So there is going to be this push and pull where the president is willing to shut down the government potentially over wall funding and Republican leadership may not be willing to do so. So you're going to see uh, a standoff, I think, not just between the president and, and his leadership, but also be, not just between Democrats and Republicans, but also between the president and Republican leaders at a time when Republican leaders are going to be looking at the calendar and saying, we've just got these two months to do anything in the world we want to do before we lose control of the House. That's not necessarily top of their list. They might be willing to negotiate and trade that away to do something else. I think right. that it's going to be a rock and roll couple of months on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, uh -huh. where Congress is working a lot harder than you're – Used to is there something in particular that you think they might try to negotiate with that wall? Right. You know, for that wall. Right. That's what they've you done. Know? You know, that's what they've been doing up until now. Is you know, is is negotiating in a way to get other things that they that they want. So it'll be interesting to see if they you know, if they stand with the president on this one and uh, How about to the give tax it? bill? Is that going to the Senate not going to pass that? Is it too much of a deficit? I think uh, it's, uh, you know, I think building? that there's not enough there's not enough time. Um, it, and I don't, it, this was not something that was on Republicans' minds, frankly, until the president brought it up a week or two before uh, election day, said that there was this mysterious uh, middle class tax cut that he wanted to do, and Republican leaders said to us, well, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, the House, um, did, pa the House did pass a bill, though. What's that? Uh, the House did pass a bill uh, to cut taxes, though. They did, they passed one bill to cut taxes, yes, but the president said he wanted to do another one, and that uh, was not something that was on their on their agenda. Now, interestingly, the president did say in that press conference that he might be willing to, to, raise, to taxes. raise taxes on corporations a couple of points if it meant that he could get uh, middle class taxes cut a little bit more. So, you know, I think that that is something that I think that that's a conversation that could continue even after the lame duck. That's the alternative universe theory of Donald Trump. <laughs> like, since he isn't ideological, he didn't have any, you know, he was a man without a party, he just wants to make deals. Like, why wouldn't he cut a deal with Chuck and Nancy mm -hmm. for DACA in exchange for some wall funding, you know, middle class tax cuts. But, but every time that Donald Trump has kind of come out of the White House for a couple minutes, he always gets pulled out to being the nativist, xenophobic, mm -hmm. like super hard right Donald Trump. Can, can I just wait? That's the first question we've really had or a real discussion about the wall and immigration. And this whole campaign going into yeah. the final mm -hmm. couple of weeks was yeah. all about immigration and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and how they were going to storm the border. Yeah, and, and gosh, Presto, we better, we we better get the draft. It. We better yeah. install the draft yeah. and start drafting, <laughs> you know, put 18-year-olds yeah, yeah, on yeah, the border. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. I just wonder, like, up here in Massachusetts, I mean, are we – are we so far away from it that it that it doesn't affect us? Are, are we are we immigrants that came here in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, you know we're not what's happening? You know we don't see what's happening down in Texas or what have you. 
just a, is or it, is it not happening? Is it not? I don't know. Is it, <laughs> or, or is or, that the real moral of the story? It actually isn't happening. Or is it a really big? Is it a big enough issue? Though? Yeah, but you know the other thing about the caravan, which I think the media will have to do some soul searching on it. I mean, look, the New York Times did put a lot of front page pictures of that caravan, which was hundreds and hundreds right. of miles away. But that shows you the power of Donald Trump. He can inject an issue. Into the into the bloodstream of the media narrative, mm -hmm. even if it's not a real, as he would put it, emergy situation. <laughs> remember, remember that tweet. <laughs> this is a real emergy. Um, you know, they were far, far away. He put. He said he was sending what eight thousand troops to the border. Yeah. They're still hundreds of miles away. Mm -hmm. They're not even combat troops. They're cooks and yeah. they're logistic people. <laughs> That's who he sent down to the border. Yeah, yeah. They're not stopping people yeah. coming across. They're and they can't. Boys. They're prohibited by, yeah, they're law. prohibited by law. That's right. Sir. Sidney Kadish, Newton, Mass. Simple question. What is the likelihood that the new Congress could enact legislation to limit corporate contributions to political campaigns? I, zero. zero. I think it's quite I mean, it's the law of the land. The Supreme low. Court has, right. has, has ruled. ruled. Um, you know, I think that the uh, last Republican who was really animated on that issue was John McCain. And even he stopped talking about it um, in the last decade uh, because he could so. see that he was not, you know, going to really move his party on that issue. It's just not an issue that is at the top of the agenda for Republicans in particular. Um, but Democrats have, you know, have certainly not been agitating either in the past. Well, they said they're going to pass. No, she that's said that's going to be part of their Pelosi's initial, right. yeah, their initial bunch of bills. They're going to And do you could see the House. Yeah. I think you could see the House pass something yeah. symbolic as a messaging yeah, right. type of, it, well, of an issue. But it is, you right. know. It's not going to go into And this has come up in the question of gun violence, because one thing that in the Parkland kids in particular are talking about is, the Parkland kids are in support, of, or they want, they are pushing the Democrats to do something about campaign finance because mm -hmm. they do see the power of the NRA and they mm -hmm. think there needs to be a countervailing mm -hmm. force in, on that. In your view, was, was, was corporate contributions swaying in, this, in the outcome of this election? I think every lesson we've seen is that it was the small contributions that were that were bigger, and that's that was you know it started with Obama, but we've just seen you know these these candidates who came out of nowhere, many of them did so by putting out a video, and people from across the country were sending money, not a lot of money, under two hundred dollars. Those small contributions have really soar, surged during this election. And if you if you give a small contribution, if you're somebody who gives fifty, seventy five hundred dollars, you're probably going to be engaged yeah. more beyond writing a check for fifty dollars or a hundred dollars. You might go join a local phone bank. You may do it from your house now, which you can do. You may you, you know lick envelopes. You may do anything depending on what your age is. If you're a big corporation, you're just signing a check and sending it over. Mm -hmm. And now, what's going to be interesting is corporations are going to have to start sending money to Democrats. Right. They're already <laughs> hiring a lot of Democratic, <laughs> aid, you know, ex-congressional aides mm -hmm. to lobby, but we have divided government now. K mm -hmm. Street adjusts like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Susan Chattis. I live in Newton, Mass. My concern for the Democrats going forward is I don't think they have resolved the, the Hillary wing and the Bernie wing. And I think that for the 2016 election, so many Bernie people did not vote. Mm -hmm. And you see, and I don't think they've resolved it. And until they have one voice, they're not going to do well. It concerns me. I mean, you have a lot of Democrats talking about guaranteed income, um, uh, national medicine. I mean, the whole thing is very, very left, and it's just not going to make it. And so if the Democrats and I mean if the Democrats of the two wings can't pull it together, it's gonna be devastating, I think, again, for the Democrats. I think it's gonna happen on both sides, actually. I mean we'll start I don't with the care Democrats. About the other side. I mean I, I do think that you're gonna see you're you're gonna see the left really agitate. There was like fifty or fifty five people who signed a letter that Donald Trump should be impeached, right? They should be in impeachment I, yeah. proceedings. That happened this year, okay, yeah. before they were actually in the power, they had the ability to do so. So I, I do think you're going to see some agitation that is going to cause a bit of a headache on the House side. I do think Nancy Pelosi knows how to run that chamber, and she will, she'll do it in a way that will that will be that will get her through the next two years. I mean, slightly successful, I believe, but it will still be very difficult. But on the Republican side too, I do think you're going to see the likes of Jim Jordan and the Freedom Caucus 
will agitate against spending. And when we're talking about Democrats, Republicans coming together on a bill, everybody says infrastructure because everybody loves infrastructure. Unions love infrastructure. Corporations love infrastructure. Freedom Caucus does Fre not Freedom Caucus like does not like it because it costs yeah. an incredible amount of money. So you could see a, 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 an agitation amongst Republicans as well where we potentially could never see anything happen. And, and, do, and don't forget, I agree with you in terms of the, what the primary battle is going to be inside the Democratic Party. But right now in Congress, the Democratic Party is more centrist yeah. than the Republican Party because guess who lost in the Republican Party? All the moderates. Who's left? The super Trumpy Freedom Caucus Republicans. So the, 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 the Republicans in Congress now are more Trumpist, you could say, more, more to the right than they were before. The Democrats span more of the spectrum. But I agree with you. The, there's a lot of left-wing energy in the party. They're going to have to battle it out in the primaries. But don't forget, Democrats want to win, yeah. win, win. What did Nancy Pelosi say to all those Democrats who said they were going to be out there campaigning, that they wouldn't vote for her? She said, go, just win, baby. That's what she said, just I think, win. And it I think that, I just think that, that you saw so many more of those left-wing candidates who lost in primaries. Yeah. I mean, look at the Michigan governor's race, right? Like the, the guy who was running from the left lost to Gretchen Whitmer, who's very centrist. So I, I'm not sure. I still think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez She's probably perfect for her district, and again, it goes to the it goes to like, yeah, but she, I think she's a bit of a unicorn, right? I think she's she's unusual. She, that was not the kind of candidate who was winning. We saw other candidates who were running from the left and lost. Also, I think it depends on the candidates themselves and how committed they are to bringing the two wings of the party together. I mean, when when Hillary Clinton lost to Barack Obama, you know, it was very painful for her and her supporters. She turned around and said, "We're going to do everything that we can to get him to win. We're all in." was not exactly what you That's saw right. That's right. Um, in 2016. Yes. It was you know, more difficult right. for, for Bernie Sanders to make that turn, and so it was no surprise that it was difficult for a lot of his supporters to make that turn, too. And it led to what we have now. It's possible. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. My name is George. I'm from Jamaica Plain. Um, so just to um, clear what I said earlier, I'm not a Trump supporter. I didn't vo vote for uh, Trump or Hillary. Uh, I think uh, they were both awful, horrible candidates, the only way that, yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, do you think there's bias when it comes to sexual assault allegations? For example, given how much Kavanaugh was dragged in the media, um, like CNN, NPR, the New York Times, yet completely silent on the allegations pressed against Democratic candidates like the Minnesota governor, uh, Keith Ellison, and uh, Democratic uh, House Representative uh, Bob Menendez. Uh, was this like an effort to ensure the Democratic Party uh, secured those seats, you think? Or um, you think, well, like, why well, aren't those well, Franken, allegations well, addressed? Uh, you know, I think, yeah. I mean, I think uh, so, Al Franken. So, but, just, but to be clear, first of all, it's, yeah. it, Bob Menendez was a, was a senator, and, and in the, you're right. Um, well, I mean, Nelson, what, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's no, no, but, I'm just, but I think Bob Menendez, I don't think that was it. But it wasn't really covered as my that point. Was that was well, there was stuff about these girls on the planet. But, but, and <laughs> Keith Ellison has... Um, domestic abuse right, as well right, as sexual right. allegations. Right. So, yeah. right. so, so why weren't these uh, like as pressing matters, especially with the whole Me Too movement? So I just think that there's a little bit of bias with that, especially with the, the Kavanaugh proceedings being as murky, if not more murky than the other situations that um, I'm talking about right now. I think you go back to Al Franken, though, and he, he was um, – Summarily dispatched. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he, he was he he was not stabbed in the back. I mean, they I was I was on TV when it happened. Yeah. There, there was they came out. It was like clockwork. Every yeah. two minutes, another se woman senator came out and said he has got to go. Yeah. To your point about Menendez, um, although that wasn't a Me Too thing, it is kind of an interesting race that that kind of crept up on us, and it was it, it's it was a case where he where he was found innocent. Yeah. He was found innocent. It was a hung jury, though, I believe, yeah. right? Yep. But, it, it, but, but it was one of those things where I do believe that he was in a state that it would have been it, it was difficult. He to, might have lost in another state. He might have lost so in another blue. state. And yeah. New Jersey was very, I understand Chris Christie had been the governor, but like it. it New Jersey has not had a Republican state. senator since 1974. Yeah. yeah. So it's a really, yeah. 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 It's a yeah. And as far as, state. as far as Keith Ellison and, and Kavanaugh are concerned, both important cases to explore. And I know all of our news organizations looked at both. There is a big difference between a state attorney general candidate and a Supreme Court nominee. So that's one thing. Well, also, the I, I don't think the women feel any Both of different. them prevailed. I don't think the women feel it's much of a difference. 
Well, I think that the, the accusations against them were. The, the well, I, 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 I'll bring us all together. <laughs> <laughs> all right. let, let me unite here. I, I, I will say this. I, I do think during the Kavanaugh situation, it did trouble me that an immediate a accusation or allegation meant he was guilty. And it did bother me that it the House... It bothered a lot of Republicans. Right, right. Well, well but, but, but look, it bothered me that the House and the Senate weren't able to, or rather the Senate, w was not able to figure this out and say, yeah. okay, we're going to do this in five days and, and do an investigation. They didn't do an investigation in yeah. five days. I mean, it was, it was so haphazardly done yeah. by everybody I that yeah. I think it's, it's a pox on Democrats and Republicans and the White House and everybody involved. Yeah, it was handled very poorly. All right. Thank you. Sir? Hi, Elliot Place, Hingham, Massachusetts. And I wanted to thank you very much for coming here and speaking and sharing with us and keeping this ball rolling, which we really got to do big time. I appreciate all the issues you brought up, but there's one issue that to me is the humongous elephant floating around and actually swimming out in Boston Harbor and <laughs> creeping up on our shores, and that is climate change oh. and global warming. And I haven't heard anything from you guys about that, and I really haven't heard much in the midterms about right. it either. Yeah. And right. it feels to me like uh, uh, a lot well, of these folks... there were referendums mm. statewide. In Washington, it lost. There was a carbon tax, right? In California, they managed to preserve the gas tax. Right. So that won. So it was a mixed bag, but in some states, global warming was on the ballot, generally in the form of referendums. But I haven't really but, heard but, much but, in general from but I think the various is a great, candidates. Yeah. No, I think and it's a I great really point. think it's huge. Right. And I think the problem, is, so I, this is one of my sort of favorite sidelines of the, of the midterms, is that I was talking to this woman who's a Republican pollster, who now is, she's a never Trumper, so she now considers herself an independent. She started this group called One Planet Women, right? And their whole issue is climate change. And she started this because exactly what you said, there aren't climate voters. And she said she'd been talking to, she was with a Republican representative who said this, like, people don't vote on the climate, so we don't talk about it. The, but the, the, you know, the other side, against, you know, against carbon tax and things like that, they're, they're putting all, that's where the oh, big yeah. corporate donations count, right? right? But the people who are trying to do something to prevent climate change, those people don't, they're not coming out and making contributions on it. So her whole thing is, we have to create climate voters. And what was so interesting to me about this is that she was, we called it, you know, getting woke with the garden clubs. She's going to these garden clubs in Virginia where there's, you know, where the rising seas are, are a real problem as they are here and elsewhere. And she's saying to them, it's not just about the melting polar caps. It's also about you can't go out in your garden because tick season lasts longer and mosquito season lasts long, longer and your kids have asthma more. So I think like people, it, climate change has not been brought down to that level for people and I think that's what has to change. Just right? think if Tom Steyer put all his money into climate change instead of impeachment. I mean, <laughs> you know, just like every town has managed to yeah. level the playing field, not quite yet, but almost with the NRA, somebody has to do what you're talking about only on a much bigger level and that with was deeper pockets, right. yeah. and then maybe we'll, we'll have that happen. And her model was the mom's demand yeah. model. So mom's demand, again, you know, action against gun violence. Her model is mom's demand action against climate change. And I don't know yet if it works, but I think it's actually, I think there's room there, certainly. It, it, it was on the ballot, too. I mean, beyond the initiatives, if you lived in Miami, Carlos uh, Carvello yeah, yeah. lost. I mean, he was a Republican, well-liked, and it was immigration and climate change. And he had to go on TV every day, and he had to say, I repudiate the president of the United States. I believe in climate change because that's what all his constituents believe in. And he ended up losing. Well, and interestingly, picked up that seat. a lot of people thought that in Florida, um, the environment was going to be a decisive issue with mm -hmm. red tide, right. you right. know, the fact that the governor, right. uh, Governor Scott, had loosened a lot of the state EPA regulations and you were getting, you know, uh, you know, it was leading to a lot more runoff and you had all these algae blooms that were really hurting a lot of the coastal tourism uh, uh, centers in the state. And it didn't turn out to have It did, you know, it, that was an issue that when we, we, we did a debate down there, again, as I mentioned earlier, between DeSantis and Gillum, which in itself was interesting because they had never met. And I was with them when they met each other, which kind of was interesting. It was actually nice. They were actually friendly to each other, yeah. given, given that, that that campaign had been so nasty. Um, 
but we talked about the algae bloom at that time because that was such a big issue. But we're moving so fast nowadays that the algae bloom, within a few days, people forgot about it. Like, they yeah. didn't want to talk about that anymore. They were on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it was being driven by Donald Trump. I mean, right. the narrative of what was happening in Florida was being driven by what was happening in Washington. Thank you. Sure. Sherry Alpert Canton, Mass. I think there were two other elephants in the room, Medicare and Social Security, and having recently started to benefit from both, um, I really worry about younger people. And I think the be one of the really bad side effects of the tax cuts is that it's going to be an excuse for the Republicans to attack Medicare and Social Security uh, to make them solvent. Um, I hope that this becomes an issue of the media asking about it. And I also think one of the practical solutions would be not to lift this ceiling on taxing income for Social Security, but remove it. Because then the more money you make, the more you pay in. I mean, uh, yeah, the more you pay in. Uh, and then it would be a progressive tax to uh, kind of make up for all the money that wealthy people have saved on the tax cut. So I'd just like to ask your opinion about that. Um, and I hope you all make it a big issue co going forward. Well, well, you know, the corollary to the health care issue for Democrats was Republicans gave a big tax cut to the rich, they blew a hole in the deficit, and they're going to come after your Medicare and Social Security to make up for that deficit. That was kind of the, the yeah. sidebar to health care. Um, not just Obamacare they're going after, but they're going after Medicare and Social Security. So that was, that, and that House, did figure. the House is what yeah. matters on that, right? The yeah. Senate can't do that without the House. It has to start in yeah. the House. Because it's a yeah. But I haven't heard package. anyone talk about removing the ceiling on I think it, except for you, Ted Kennedy, and that was decades well, ago. Well, whenever you get into a serious discussion, which we haven't had in a long time in Washington, about entitlements, you get that as one of the ideas. Remove the cap. I don't know if that solves the whole problem, but it goes a certain distance. But if and when both sides ever decide to, to be serious about that, that idea is going to come back up because it always does. But you know what? Both sides doesn't, they don't want to address right now, that issue. Don't. You know why they don't want to address this? Because it's $21 trillion right yeah. now. And, and if, if we're really going to talk about entitlements, like the real question is, are we going to have the real hard talk and say, whatever you put in, you're not going to get back out? Because the only way we're going to cut back on this deficit is not them saving money on a million dollars here, $10 million, $20 million there. It's going in and slicing and dicing Social Security, Medicare, and Medicare. Yeah, but after the Republicans have just added $2 trillion to well, the deficit with tax cuts, you, it's know, hard to you do can't it. go in and cut entitlements. And the, Donald Trump doesn't want to. Donald Trump is fine with big deficits. The real, and he doesn't want to touch entitlements. The really depressing thing about covering Capitol Hill is that there are so many issues like that uh, where they need to be addressed, whether it is uh, immigration or, or climate change or Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, you know, these big, tough issues, in order the, for the two sides to even engage on those issues, there has to be a level of trust between them because they have to say, you know, this is going to be so painful for both of us. We're going to have to be willing to share the pain and, you know, and sort of work something out that we can both live with. And there's just that trust doesn't exist for them to even start the conversations anymore. You know, they used to at least try. You know, you have the gang of six or the gang of eight, whether it's on, you know, on, on the debt or on immigration, and you don't even see that anymore because there is this assumption, you know, we're going to get burned by the other side because everyone is looking to win the argument of the day, not to win the race. And so that is... You know, really One quick thing. You also might want to ask him how his in-laws became citizens in about a week, while legal immigrants have to wait <laughs> years, and the process really has slowed lawyer, down a lot. I understand. Has he ever been asked point blank know. about that? I'm shocked. I've never I'm heard sure. him asked. <laughs> yeah. I think that that uh, the lawyer was asked. I think he was, was asked. The question he, was, he did interviews on it. Yeah. And explained yeah. how we, how it happened. Yeah. Right. Chain migration. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, I'm in radio, so I won't hog this mic. Uh, the gentleman before me stole my thunder by thanking you for being here, which I do as well. However, I'd like to add a caveat. If it weren't for all the people here that make this democracy work, we would not be standing here and listening to your knowledge. And I'd like to thank all of you for being a part of this, because I've looked around, and your eyes are riveted on them. Thank you.
Now, with that said, <laughs> two things. One, no wall. I have, I have been to Berlin in the 70s. I saw what a wall can do. I don't ever want to see that again, especially from this country. Number two, <laughs> let's get out of the war business. Let's put an end to this stuff once and for all. We have a department of defense, not an a department of offense. The military industrial complex that Eisenhower spoke of so long ago, we are caught up in this thing and cannot get out. It's, it's a mindset that we are in. We have destroyers from World War II rusting in, up in ports all around this country. That's military-grade steel that can be just chopped up, melted down, and made into bridges. And we're not doing anything except building more destructive weapons. And the next time I see an orphan child, I want everybody to remember that it's our tax dollars and the tax breaks that the companies that make this stuff got that created that orphan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You know, he does, you know, that he does make an interesting point, particularly when it comes to immigration, which is that we all know what the president stands for and what he wants to do, uh, whether, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, have Democrats figured out, you know, not just what they don't want to do, but what they do want to do when it comes to immigration beyond, you know, uh, providing, you know, providing protections for, for the dreamer population. But that does seem to be an area where Democrats haven't quite figured out how to, how to talk about when that. When they had issue. a Democratic president, they knew what they wanted. They wanted comprehensive immigration mm -hmm. reform mm -hmm. with a path to citizenship for a certain number, certain amount of the 11 million here illegally. But I, I think without the White House, they're not they, going to try not, that. I think know that it's the not dreamers, a for yeah. them. They, the Beyond the Dreamers right. is not a wing. Yeah. Beyond but the, the Dreamers, dreamers is a place to start. Right, yeah. right. But I think they, it, it may be because we're coming out of the election, right? They, it, unless they were talking about families being separated at the border or Dreamers being denied, they weren't mm. talking about immigration. They, they knew to stay away from Except it. for they don't want a wall, right? You know, you know it's, uh, the, I was in McAllen, Texas a few weeks ago, mm. uh, which is one of the main entry points between Mexico and uh, in, in Texas, in the United States, and I was struck by how people who live down there are not affected by this. They're so used to this, mm -hmm. this traffic moving back and forth, you, you know, that the idea of a wall makes no sense. Now, they do believe, you know, just talking to folks down there, that there needs to be enforcement, yeah. but it needs to be technology and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't like the idea of just trying to put a wall up and keeping everybody out. That's not how they live down there. That isn't, it's very transactional back and forth across the border. And don't forget, with the exception of this seasonal surge, caravans, illegal immigration is at the lowest point it's right. been in like 15 years. That Trump kind of gins up and then, you know, sometimes says he's solved. <laughs> Hi, um, Larry Kula from Newton, Mass. Um, so, uh, the Democrats won a lot in the House, but lost in the Senate. And, um, you know, in today's times, there was an op-ed by Paul Krugman, maybe some of you read about maybe the disproportionate advantage some rural states have in um, electing senators and um, the unfortunate weight that the uh, Senate has in electing federal judges and Supreme Court judges. And um, so I wonder, A, if you have any opinions on the Paul Krugman piece, if anybody read it, and B, um, what you think the consequences of that might be given the, the judgeship appointments in terms of abortion rights, gay rights, transgender rights, things of that sort. Well, this is how the founders designed the system to give rural states, you know, more weight, but by 2040, I think, that something like 70% of the country is going to live in 15 states, so they're going to only have 30 senators, and 30% of the country is going to have 70 senators. In other words, right. it's going to get worse. Now, that's just a thought experiment. What happens when you have a minority, super minority of the country basically confirming judges who 
do things that the majority of the population disagree with. I don't know. But that's, I think, as time goes on, that's going to become more of a subject for discussion. Right. I mean, didn't on the, you know, when you tally up just the straight votes that Democrats got versus Republicans in this election, yeah. what was it, a nine point Something difference? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but this time they actually right. end up with probably nine percent more seats. In other words, well, be usually right. because it's they, not. Yeah. Because it wasn't, the vote wasn't all concentrated. Like in right. 2016, in California right. and New York, I mean, which Hillary Clinton, yeah. you know, won the popular vote. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. what could you Usually, vote? there's been many times when the national vote for the House, Democrats, you know, win like 55% of it, but they still end up with 47% right. of the seats. That's not what happened this time. The way yeah. the lines are drawn. Yeah. Right. But it's a real, it's a real phenomenon. So yeah. he's right about that, sir. Yeah, uh, Paul Uvino and Braintree. Uh, an observation uh, after sitting through the entire press conference yesterday, <laughs> and Mark, you said he asked some reporters to yeah. five times. Yeah. yeah. Followed, followed by the firing of Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. <laughs> I don't know if it reminded anybody else, but it immediately reminded me of the baptism scene from The Godfather. <laughs> uh, with that said, I, uh, if you haven't seen it, you understand. <laughs> uh, with that said, this is about, I'm old enough to have grown up uh, with Walter Cronkite and Edward R. Murrow a bit earlier, and I was so, so, fairly young. So you young. remember when the Red Sox lost? Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was only, so that was only last year, yeah. though. I do, too. <laughs> um, and the credibility that an Edward R. Murrow, who put Joe McCarthy in his place, uh, Walter Cronkite, when he spoke on the war, LBJ said, if I've lost, Walter Cronkite, I've lost the war. And now I see Jim Acosta filling that same role, but at the same time, and I guess it's a criticism of maybe management of, of, of CNN and others, they're really backing off. And I think I almost heard Jack, uh, Don Lemon, Jack Lemon, uh, backing off, and, and maybe Chris Cuomo, of whether it came down, do not talk about this on air, but I got the sense that they do not want to confront Trump uh, on how he is treating the press. And I think that's a major Ooh, mistake. Whoa. I, I, think, I, you know, I, I think I could sit down and have a cup of coffee with you, Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo, and yeah. they would disagree. Well, I, I mean, that I, is, okay. that's yeah, like their I, energy. I, gather, I, I sensed and I heard a bit of reticence yeah. from them, mm. be that as it may. You, you cannot back down at this point from what he is doing because he wins every time you do it. But, but Jim Acosta is not going to, like, disappear and stop covering the White oh, House. Oh, I understand that. Like he described, I mean, he'll be out there with the White House behind him. He'll just be in Lafayette Park. I, I, mean, I, I also think it's worth pointing out, too, and, and it was a great moment yesterday uh, during that news conference when the whole thing happened with Acosta, and then uh, it was given to Peter Alexander. Peter yeah. Alexander goes, I just want to point out that, that, that Jim Acosta is a really good right. reporter. It was important just be, just to show sol solidarity yeah. because Trump really wins, or any politician, whether you're Democrat or Republicans, when they divide us. Yeah. When they can divide us, th then all's lost. Okay, he hasn't divided all of us yet. So I mean, I think right. that's some solace we can. Take. I think, and this is, I will say, this is a situation that everyone is feeling their way through because right. nobody has any experience with this sort of thing. And I think that you know, for the media, or for for. What the White House press corps or anyone else, I, you know, there is this sort of, you know, your instinct on one hand is to not make yourself the story. So you don't want to get out there and talk day in and day out about mm -hmm. the president's relationship with the press. Um, and on the other hand, to point out, you know, if the White House is, for example, disseminating a, a, a video that's been doctored and that kind hmm. of thing. So, uh, you know, it is a, it is a, a, a work in progress. But well, Dan you know, Rather, to an extent, had that confrontation yeah. with, with Nixon. But, Right. But, you know, the, the, there's no doubt that the First Amendment is undergoing a stress test like every other democratic institution, but it's really important to kind of differentiate the, the, the truly consequential from the merely outrageous. I think taking away the hard pass of a reporter is pretty extreme. However, 
it's not as extreme as other things that he's threatened to do, like revoke the license, even right. though he can't do this. Oh, he said at various times right? he was going to revoke the license of television stations. Yeah. He didn't want the merger of Time Warner and AT&T um, well. AT and, uh, AT to go through, which so far the courts have not ruled in his favor. When you see other countries whose leaders he admires really destroying the First Amendment, they don't have the First Amendment, but freedom of the press, like in Hungary, where he, you know, the, the Orban installs his own people to run state TV, you know, whatever you want to say about Fox, and I am a commentator on Fox, they don't, we, that has not happened here. So far, I would say that the press is holding up pretty well mm -hmm. under the stress test. I think mm -hmm. so. We have time to, for one more question. Just keep up the fight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, so okay. I will go to Yeah, you. Viviana Planine, also from Newton. You had a lot of people from Newton tonight. Um, I have just a question. I am a high school teacher, and uh, if uh, Mr. Trump would be in my class, he would be suspended. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't be with me. If we were in a, any job, I think he would be fired. Now, with the political scene changing, uh, why can we talk about impeachment? I understand that politically seems that that's not the way uh, that is um, feasible, but to me as a person, I mean that I can stand uh, someone immoral uh, in the White House. I don't know why impeachment is not an option. I would uh, like to know. Well, I think that there are practical reasons and political reasons. Okay. First of all, the practical reason is that House Democrats, uh, you know, have just are just going to be taking power, and they want to show the country that you know they're not just out to get the president; that they actually want to govern, uh, because that's going to be very important for keeping the majority in 2020 and potentially for getting a Democrat elected. They want, want to show that they can, you know, that they can focus on issues that matter to Americans um, politically. They, it, they can start impeachment proceedings, but you need two-thirds of the Senate. Oh, yeah. and impeachment not, is not removal. You have to have con the so. Senate. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of the Senate has to vote to remove a president. That's not going to happen. And so they think that they're, you know, they're biding their time to see what, what Mueller comes up with. And, you know, I think that they, they feel that that is their strongest move, is to wait and see what the Mueller investigation so yields and just, before just as they... As a, Sorry. Before they go forward. Just as a moral and ethical matter, the way to remove a president that you think is immoral is at the ballot box. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's not through some deus ex machina, Bob Mueller's going to save us, we're going to impeach Trump. He's, you know, no. I mean, look what, look what everybody just did. You know, voting matters. And that's, you know. Well, I'm going to make that the last word. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.